our uh, main lecture for tonight. And it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. He has been my student uh, in physiology. So when he was still a first year student, I already noticed uh, how he would focus on things that he is passionate about. And he went on to take up his pediatric residency at the Philippine General Hospital and as well as his uh, pediatric nephrology fellowship also at the Philippine General Hospital. He also spent some time at the at Montefiore no, in New York uh, studying also pediatric nephrology. And as a, uh, he is with us as a faculty and in the Department of Physiology together with our PSN president, Dr. Elizabeth Montemayor. And when he entered our department, I already know, knew that he is into fluid and electrolytes. No? That's his passion. And he immediately took the lecture on potassium metabolism from me which, by the way, is a favorite topic of mine. No? And uh, Doctor, our speaker for tonight um, uh, is a, a very good uh, teacher. And in fact, in 2019, he was voted by the students as an outstanding teacher in the basic sciences due to his many innovations in the teaching of renal physiology. He was also uh, an outstanding nephrologist in research in, uh, by, by the Pediatric Nephrology Society of the Philippines. And he was also the chairman of the committee which drafted the Philippine Pediatric Society consensus statements for parenteral fluid therapy. Um, currently, he is uh, the training officer of the Division of Pediatric Nephrology but he will be soon my successor as chief of the division because I'll be retiring next month. And currently, he's just been promoted as professor of the Department of Physiology. So, friends and colleagues, uh, let's welcome Dr. Francisco Anacleto, who will talk to us on practical approach to sodium and water disorders. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Philippine Society of Nephrology for inviting me for two reasons. One, I cannot say no to your boss, our boss, Dr. Montemayor, and to my friend, Rafael Villanueva, so I cannot say no. And especially, they gave me a very difficult topic. As Dr. Bonson mentioned, uh, I love potassium more than sodium because sodium is much diffi difficult in terms of understanding or looking at its physiology. Uh, let's see. Oh, my next slide. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, so my topic is to talk about approaching sodium and water disorders in a way that it is practical and clinical. And the bottom line is we look at whether it's too little sodium or too much water, okay? My objectives, I'll be presenting a case with sodium and water imbalance, and I will differentiate volume from osmolar disorders, which is very important understanding sodium and water disorders. And I will try to discuss a diagnostic and therapeutic approach to dyslipidemias. Uh, we have a 21-year-old female, uh, known case of SLE nephritis since 2015, so she was probably minus five, 16 years old. 
very like all patients in PGH, she had poor follow-up and non-compliant to conventional medications. She comes in now with postprandial vomiting, but she is awake and coherent. Physical exam, well perfused, but with periorbital and pedal edema. Blood pressure, a little bit high, 150 over 90. So they consulted a private hospital. And let's just focus on the fluid management of this particular case. Uh, they gave one liter of 0.9 normal saline solution. So when we see this patient, we ask ourselves, is this a sodium problem or is it a water disorder? Is there too little salt or there's too much water? I usually give this table to our medical students, even my residents and fellows, to help us understand, to differentiate one disorder from another. They are entirely different disorders, but very related. Okay, so when we talk about sodium disorders, it is usually we deal with volume. While when we talk about water disorders, it is osmolarity. So there's a difference between the two. And when we remember, if you remember your body fluid compartments, okay, when you talk about sodium disorders, in most cases, it affects the extracellular fluid space. And we all know that your ECF has your interstitial and your plasma volume. While your water disorders are your ICF, intracellular fluid space. Okay, clear so far. So now, what is the regulation bit, behind these sodium disorders and water disorders. Okay, when you talk about sodium disorders, the usual regulation is your RAS. You all know that. It's your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. While your water disorders are your, it's your antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so they are very different, but what, what uh, connects them is, if you remember, is your angiotensin 2. Okay. Now let's go to the clinical presentation. When we look at, uh, when we look at uh, low volume, okay, you see interstitial problems. So sunken eyeballs, fontanelles, et cetera, or tenting, okay? While when you talk about plasma volume, since it deals with the plasma volume, you have hypotension, tachycardia, poor pulses, or even shock. On the other end of the spectrum, if it's high volume, interstitial high volume, you see your edema, pleural effusion, and congestion. While, of course, if there's shock, there is hypertension when you deal with plasma volume, okay? Now, when we talk about osmolarity disorders, hypoosmolar, okay, it's neurologic signs and symptoms. Okay, and now when we talk about hyperosmolar, it is usually thirst or again, neurologic signs and symptoms. But most of the time, if you're hyperosmolar, you are dehydrated. As you can see now in this table, dehydration is very different from shock. Okay, sometimes we interchange these two terms, but it's very important that you know how to differentiate one from the other because your management will be dictated on what type of disorder your patient has. Okay. Now, this becomes the tricky part when you talk about osmolarity disorders, okay? When you are hypoosmolar, it can be eubulimic, hypobulimic, or hyperbulimic. It is very related with volume. That's why it's quite confusing. And as you can see from the different relationships, whether eubulimic, hypobulimic, or hyperbulimic. Eubulimic is your SIADH, okay? You have normal total body sodium, but you have an excess in water. While hypovolemic, these are your diarrheas, etc., diuretics. You have low total body sodium, more than your total body water loss. You, lose, you are losing both sodium and water, but you are more losing sodium than water. In essence, you are retaining water. Okay, hypervolemic, as mentioned there. Now, similarly, hyperosmolar has euvolemic, hypovolemic, and hypervolemic. What is important to remember about the clinical presentation between the two is that when you talk about volume disorders, they're usually cardiac in manifestation because you deal with the plasma volume, but there's also dermatologic because you have the interstitial space. While when you talk about osmolarity disorders, it is usually 
neurologic in manifestation. As we all know, the brain is 80% water. That's why it is the most frequent organelle or organ that is being affected with osmolarity disorders. Now, let's go about laboratory stuff. Now, when we talk about low volume, what is your laboratory test that can help you with sodium disorders that's in low in volume? And we usually do this. We look at weight loss. It's hard to measure total body sodium in the clinics. That's why the best thing is we do weight monitoring. We always push our residents, interns to do weight monitoring so we can actually assess how much volume is being retained or gained. Okay? Similarly, high volume means weight gain. Now, when we talk about water disorders, hyposmolar and hypersmolar, what is a very good laboratory test that can help us determine if there's too much water or very little water? And you're right, it is your serum sodium. Where if you're hyponatremic, you are not losing sodium, but you're actually gaining water. Similarly, if you're hypernatremic, you are not gaining sodium, but you are losing water. Okay, so it is your serum sodium that is very, very important. Now, what is more critical in defining sodium disorders from water disorders is your choice of IV fluid. When we deal with low volume, of course, you're losing sodium. Therefore, a very practical thing to do is to give something that is high in sodium. And that is why, you're, that's why we give isotonic solutions in a very, very fast manner, within 30 to 60 minutes. Okay? While for high volume, there's too much salt, we remove that too much salt and limit it to around 77 mechs of sodium chloride a day at a reduced rate, depending on your patient. Okay? Now, when we deal with a smaller problems, okay, you give an isotonic or, or 3% sodium chloride uh, solution. An isotonic solution is not to correct hyponatremia, mind you. An isotonic solution is a way to prevent hyponatremia. Remember, when you deal with hyponatremia, you have too much water. So you want to prevent giving hypotonic fluids. And the only way is to give isotonic solutions. The knee-jerk reaction of some physicians is when they see a patient with hyponatremia, the best thing is to give 0.9 because they're knowing, they're thinking that the patient is losing sodium. So I have to give something with sodium with this 0.9 normal saline. But it's actually wrong, okay? You give an isotonic solution to prevent hyponatremia. Now, what about 3% sodium chloride? You might argue with me, why did you say, why would you give 3% sodium chloride in a patient who is hyponatremic? That contradicts, that contradicts what I'm saying, right? I'm hyponatremic, therefore I have to give something that's very high in sodium, 3%. Actually, it's wrong. You give your 3% sodium chloride, not for the sodium content, mind you, not for the sodium content, but because of the very high tonicity of that 3%, it draws in water out of the uh, extra cell fluid, cor correcting your hyponatremia. Okay, again, 3% is not to correct the sodium, but to remove the water from your system. Okay, and what is critical without hy with hyposmolar disorders, whether hyponatremic or hypernatremic, you have to be very, very careful in correcting the serum sodium. We don't want it to be corrected as soon as possible, otherwise your brain uh, has, has not uh, adapted to that change in milieu and it can either blow up or shrink, okay? Similarly with hyper or smaller disorders. Now, as you can see, when we look at the management between sodium and water disorders, what do you notice? When we deal with sodium disorders, especially low volume, you want it to be as fast as possible, okay? While when you do it water disorders, you want to be regulated and slowly and surely, okay? So that's why it is so important to differentiate whether your patient has a sodium disorder or a water disorder. Otherwise, if your management is the other way around, then you go into a lot of trouble. Well, the next few slides, I'm giving a warning. There's uh, math, very math, mathematically challenged uh, slides. So, but don't panic. I think this is being recorded. You can skim if you have to, to the more practical stuff. Okay. 
We all know this formula, okay? Kidney clearance formula, the clearance concept, okay? Where your uh, uh, urine volume multiply it with your uh, creatinine, the amount of creatinine in your urine, urine over the amount of solute in your plasma. Similar with your creatinine clearance, you have this formula. So we all remember this type of uh, clearance formula. Now let's go to free water clearance formula. Volume is the amount of urine that you have. Always remember that your urine has osmols and has a clearance of water. That's the simple formula that you have to remember, okay? So you have your urine, which is consistent with, consisting of osmols and water. Now, if you remember your, uh, is this algebra, okay? That's why we have algebra in pre-med, okay? So we can move all these factors and using this formula, your creatinine clearance or clearance formula, you have this formula, okay? You just, this uh, clearance of osmols will have this, urine osmol times the volume over plasma osmolarity, okay? You just substituted it. And if you remove the volume to simplify the formula, you have this. So this is your free water clearance formula. Why am I spending time showing the deriv derivation of this formula? Sometimes I'm too lazy to look at the formulas. It's so hard to memorize the free water clearance formula. But what is more important is that you know that your urine has a clearance of osmos and clearance of water. So the first equation is more important than you can actually derive and play around with the equation to get your free water clearance formula. Graphically, if you look at this, if at the dilute urine, which is around 140 millimoles, you, when you have a dilute urine, you have one liter of isosmotic urine with one liter of free water, okay? And you add it up, you have two liters. Similarly, with a concentrated urine, it's the other way around, okay? Your urine volume is low with one liter, but you have a clearance of two liters of isosmotic urine, but you have to subtract one liter of free water. So why am I showing this table? This is more important. When you have a dilute urine, okay, your free water clearance is positive. But when you have a concentrated urine, your free water clearance is negative. What do I mean by that? If you have a positive free water clearance, you are peeing out all the excess water. Well, if you have a negative free water clearance, you are reabsorbing and retaining that water, okay? Such that when you look at how the kidneys respond, respond to dysnatremias, when you are hyponatremic, for you have to have normal kidneys to correct itself, you, have a, you should have a positive free water clearance or a very low urine specific gravity, right? Because you're trying to remove that excess water from your hyponatremia. On the other hand, if you are hypernatremic, okay, you have a negative free water clearance, meaning you are not removing that water, but you're actually retaining water, okay, with such that to correct the hypernatremia. So if the values are different, for example, if I am hyponitremic, but my urine-specific gravity is concentrated, something is wrong. Because we all know when you are hyponatremic, my urine should be dilute. But when you look at your patient and he has a concentrated urine, something is wrong. So you have to investigate why this is so. Okay, here so far. I have two patients. This is our initial patient, the 21-year-old female, and another 21-year-old male, same numbers. Same serum sodium, 110, okay? Same input, output, same urine osmolarity, plasma osmolarity. So if you compute for your free water clearance, they will have the same free water clearance. What did they say about hyponatremia and uh, urine-specific gravity? So if I'm hyponatremic, to be normal, I should have a dilute urine, right? So in, this, in both patients, they are hyponatremic, but look at their urine-specific gravity. They are concentrated. So does it mean they have some problem with their antidiuretic hormone? Okay. If you remember the countercurrent mechanism, okay, for, for us to have a concentrated urine, there are two factors, very important. 50% okay, is due to your sodium and chloride 
uh, osmols, while the other 50% to concentrate is your urea. Okay? And when we talk about free water clearance, it relates to all the total solutes in the body, urea, sodium chloride, etc., etc. Okay? And we all know it's a major solute, urea, but it is an ineffective solute. Okay? It cannot push any, it cannot uh, provide tonicity in your uh, intravascular space. However, uh, it obligates urinary water loss. So what do we mean by that? If you have urea, it means there's a lot of water that is involved when you talk about losses. Okay? And in sodium avid states like congestive heart failure, uh, renal failure, okay? sometimes they tend to present paradoxically with a concentrated urine but with water excretion. What do we mean by that? Okay? They have concentrated urine but they are actually excreting free water, free water. Okay, so that is when you have sodium avid states. Okay, let's go back to our patient, patient A and patient B. Now we have your urine electrolytes. Okay, and if we compute for their electrolyte free water clearance, okay, and this is the formula, you just remove osmolarity and just look at the sodium and potassium. You're trying to remove all the sodium and potassium into the urine, so you're left with just urea and water. Okay, same formula, but just remove particularly. Okay, so now there's a difference. Okay, your patient A, our patient, okay, has an electrolyte free water clearance of plus 280 mil per minute, while our patient B has a retention of water of around 180 mil per minute. So what does it tell you? Who has SIADH in this patient? In this case, is it patient A or patient B? Okay, it's patient B. So you have serum sodium that is hyponatremic and because the electrolyte free water clearance is negative 180 mil per minute, okay? Similar, uh, on the other hand, patient A, okay? Although the patient hyponatremic, the kidneys are still responding by urinating around 280 mL per minute of free water. And this is because of urea. This is a sodium avid state uh, condition in our patient who is 21 years old. Okay, so there's a difference now between free water clearance and electrolyte free water clearance. Okay. Now, what do we know so far? Alterations in body water, again, are largely responsible for a change in the plasma sodium. So your serum sodium, as Dr. Dolit Bonson mentioned, is actually a problem of water balance, okay? Caution against using free water clearance because this could indicate whether there will be changes in cell volume. In sodium avid conditions, the kidneys are actually excreting free water, although their urine is still concentrated. Okay? Your electrolyte free water approach predicts the degree of change in the plasma sodium and however it does not reveal the basis for change in sodium nor does it lead to correct therapy so there's a limitation of your electrolyte free water clearance okay so graphically what is electrolyte free water clearance okay you're retaining around 2.7 liters of water okay so from a normal 140 initial 140 uh, millimoles per liter it goes down because of retention of 2.7 liters of water. Okay, this is your electrolyte free water clearance. Let me introduce another, we call it tonicity balance. So we talk about balance, it means there should be two things that should be in balance, okay? And that is sodium and water, okay? So you divide the space into sodium and water. For example, okay, I gave two liters of 0.9 normal saline, okay? 0.9 normal saline is around 150 mex. Let's just round it up to 150 mex of sodium chloride. So when two liters, 150 times two is 300. Okay, clear so far. This is giving two liters of 0.9 normal saline solution. Now, since a balance, there should be an output. We look now at the urine output. In our patient, she just urinated around 600 ml of, what, of urine. Okay, or 0 0.6 liters with this, uh, with this electrolyte picture, uh, around 50 mex of sodium and potassium. Okay, so this is the relationship between 
tonicity balance between sodium and water. So what do we do now? You just subtract, okay? Input and output, okay? There's a retention now of 1.4 liters. 2 minus 0.6, you get 1.4 liters, okay? Do you follow? Okay, with this uh, retention of water, we expect the serum sodium to go down, okay? Sometimes we end here, okay? But sometimes it's often that there should be a balance also of sodium. And if you look, 300 minus 50, you get 250 millimoles of electrolytes. So this patient is not just retaining water, but is also retaining sodium. Okay, if this were just if we're just using electric free water clearance, we'll just focus on the water and forget about the sodium component of this case. So this is what we call tonicity balance. If we make it into a graph, as you can see, okay, this is giving two liters of 0.9 normal saline with an output of 600 ml. I just put it in the table. Same same uh, idea. Okay, what if I gave three liters of 0.9 normal saline. If you look at the table, EFW or electrolyte free water clearance remains the same because you're just looking at the output and not focusing more on the input, but your tonicity balance changes, okay? What if I, do not, I did not give anything, no infusion and the output is unchanged? Again, your electrolyte free water clearance is the same, okay? But your tonicity balance is different, okay? So it depends on the in input and output of a particular case, okay? So what am I saying? As you can see, if you just do electric free water clearance, you will forget about sodium and you just focus on the water, okay? And if this, if I gave for the first uh, two liters of 0.9 normal saline, okay, the patient retained 1.4 liters of water, then I have to remove 1.4 liters. At the same time, I want to also to remove 250 millimoles of sodium with some form of diuretic, etc. Okay, that is your tonicity balance affecting your management. You're not just focusing on water, but you're actually also focusing on the sodium component of your particular condition, this particular condition. Ah, that's it. And SpongeBob will say, I hate math, okay? It's too much work for one solution. Okay, sometimes we get so lazy, I just get my phone and do the math, okay? And not sure if math is hard as hell or I'm just too hard to understand, okay? So with that, I said it's practical. I just showed you all the math stuff. Now, what is the practical point? Okay, what is my suggested evaluation for hyponatremia? Remember, there's now a relationship again of osmolarity and volume. Whenever you have a patient who is on a smaller problem, always assess volume first, okay? You have to look at the volume of your patient before looking at the uh, other, uh, other problems for your patient. Always assess volume status in a patient with a smaller disorder, okay? And it can be hypovolemic, as I mentioned earlier. It can be clinical euvolemia or hypervolemic, okay? And you just look at the urine sodium, and if you have your osmolites, you look at the urine, os uh, urine osmolarity and the plasma osmolarity. And if you see this relationship, if you're hypovolemic, uh, with, this, with these uh, parameters, it can be extra renal loss or renal adrenal loss, okay? What about clinical eubulimia? Similarly, look at urine sodium and urine osmolarity, okay? It can be water intoxication or SIADH you can actually differentiate water intoxication from SIADH by just looking at the urine osmolarity. And hypervolemia, as seen in this uh, flowchart, you will see a very low urine sodium, okay? So you have CHF, liver failure, and uh, AKI, CKNB. What is important about this flowchart is, well, of course, if you're hypervolemic, there's renal loss, you have to replace. If there's clinical euvolemia, but with water intoxication or SIDH or too much water, you have to restrict water. And if you have hypervolemia, you have to remove water, okay? Similarly, when you are hypernatremic, again, you want to look at the, the volume status of your patient, okay? So again, similar, hypovolemia, 
clinical eubulimia or hypervolemia. Now, you look again with your urine sodium and urine osmolarity. It can be extrarenal or renal, as from the conditions that, I, that, that is being shown, or it can be clinical eubulimia with hypernatremia. You have your diabetes insipidus or with extrarenal water loss, or hypervolemia with a very high urine sodium and with an, with the, which is due to an increased sodium load. Okay? So it's the same with hyponatremia and hypernatremia in terms of assessing and evaluating these patients. What happened to our patient? Okay, so as I mentioned, they started with a one liter of 0.9 normal saline, then doses of 3% sodium chloride infusions. Okay, so they're actually grasping at straws. They don't know what, what, what should we do? The patient is uh, hyponatremic, etc. So they gave 0.9 normal saline, then suddenly, oh, well, too much water. Let's give 3% sodium chloride infusion. So it's a shotgun method and looking at this patient. Actually, this, ha this happened. This is actually an actual case, okay? Understandably, the serum sodium remained low, and with the 3% sodium chloride infusions, the volume overload, remember, your patient has periorbital edema already, worsened, okay? So they challenged with diuretics and water restrictions. So they're really doing whatever, so knee-jerk, 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 knee-jerk management, okay? So again, the serum sodium was so low, hyponatremic, what, what, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with our management? So is it a problem that the patient is not having or not secreting antidiuretic hormone? Or the patient is not urinating water or not really act, uh, appropriately urinating water such that the hyponatremia persisted, okay? True enough, the labs came out, the patient has chronic kidney disease stage five from SLE nephritis, okay? So in this, they initiated with renal replacement therapy by peritoneal dialysis. And of course, there's gradual improvement and normalization of volume and osmolar disorders. So what's the lesson learned? Okay, always look at the, the cost for, for the condition that is presenting with hyponatremia or volume disorders. Remember, CKD5 giving 3% sodium chloride infusions. They're lucky the patient did not go to pulmonary congestion. Okay. I'll just add something about COVID-19 just to be uh, relevant in this day and age, okay? There's one research, uh, this, this was in May, I think, okay? What is the sodium status and kidney involvement during COVID-19 infection, okay? This is a cartoon of your kidney cell, okay? And you have your ACE2 receptors and your SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. When you have low sodium balance, very, very low sodium, meaning volume, hypotension, etc. not taking too much sodium. What happens? Of course, your ACE2 receptors increase in number. And with the increase in number of ACE2 receptors, SARS-CoV-2 can attach them and may lead to kidney involvement uh, tremendously, okay? So there's, the kidney involvement is more likely, okay? What if you have very high sodium intake? like some Filipinos do, too much baguong, okay? The ACE2 receptors are not that prominent. Therefore, the, the SARS-CoV-2 cannot attach and kidney involvement will be less likely, okay? So what are the implications? I don't know. I'm not really an expert in COVID-19 yet, okay? But when you have low blood volume, decreased sodium balance, well, logically, it will increase the kidney susceptibility to damage from COVID-19, right? But the other end is, can high salt intake protect the kidney, right? So that's quite uh, counterintuitive. So it's really, do we advise patients now to take in a lot of salt to protect their kidneys, okay? Especially hypertensive and diabetics, they're all, we push them to be on a low salt diet. Can it be a risk factor why they are, they are predisposed to develop COVID-19 kidney problems? Or is it a volume? or osmolarity issue per se, or it's a combination of both, okay? This is my last slide. What are my takeaways? What did we learn from this uh, very short lecture? Number one, we tried, if this is the only thing that you can remember, remember never mind the mathematical equations, okay? Pangyabang lang yun eh. 
Okay, but what is important is dyslipidemias are disorders in water balance and not with sodium homeostasis. Okay, so if you're hyponatremic, you are not actually losing sodium, but you're actually retaining water. Similarly, hypernatremic, you are not retaining sodium, but you're actually losing water. This is the most important thing to remember about this uh, presentation. As I emphasize, serum sodium reflects water content. There's no laboratory test for now that's very accurate that can measure our total body water. Okay, so we rely on a surrogate measure, which is your serum sodium. Differentiating volume from a smaller disorders, as you can see, will affect your clinical judgment in fluid. So it's so hard to mix match the two. You have a volume disorder and you want to correct it as a, a smaller problem, very, ra very regulated and slow, and then you, you lose your patient. Or similarly, if you have a smaller problem and you corrected it so fast, okay, then you lead to your brain to be un uh, unaccommodating to the too much water or less water that you gave. Okay? And a new uh, information that can be helpful is we have your free water clearance, but this is limitations, okay? It cannot differentiate whether you are sodium avid condition from SIADH. So we look at E electrolyte free water clearance, where you just remove sodium and potassium and you retain your urea and water, okay? And again, it has its limitations. It doesn't help in correcting. We just focus on the water component, but when you look at some conditions, there's also a sodium uh, component that is involved in the pathophysiology, and therefore it would be helpful to manage this condition, okay? So as in this, as in this case, uh, my fellows and residents were just doing knee-jerk management of the hyponatremia, but not looking for the underlying cause, especially if it's refractory. You did everything. I followed Dr. Anacleta's advice, blah, blah, blah. And why is this patient still hyponatremic or hypernatremic? So you look for that underlying cause. Look for the mechanism. It's sometimes, as Dr. Dollett mentioned, the kidneys are, a log are logical orga organs. They, they, you have to look for the mechanism that would help you dictate your therapy. Okay? So in conclusion, I presented the case with sodium and water imbalance in chronic kidney disease. Uh, I differentiated volume from a smaller disorders, and I discuss a diagnostic and therapeutic approach to dysnephthemias using these clearance formulas of free water, electrolyte free water, and the new tonicity balance. Okay, for more nephrology concepts for the millennials out there, you can visit my YouTube, uh, Ibato K Doc Bato. Maraming maraming salamat po for taking some time to listen to this lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anacleto, for your very enlightening lecture. Buhay pa ba ang lahat ng nakikinig? <laughs> um, before we go into the question and answer, uh, I can see one question in the Q&A box. I would just like to remind everyone, uh, I don't know whether we can show the the poster but next week our webinar uh, includes a powerhouse cast and this is on optimizing outcomes in PD services in resource limited settings that will be on August 26 and our lecture this will be in partnership with the International Society of Nephrology. Our speakers one and other than our current PSN president, my classmate and kumare, Dr. Elizabeth Montemayor, the ISN president himself, uh, Dr. Vivek Kananja, our friend from Singapore, Dr. Adrian Liu, and this will be moderated by Dr. Russell Villanueva. So make sure you uh, 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 reserve no that uh, time next Wednesday. 
So let's now go into the question and answer. Uh, the one question here, um, can we give D50 water instead of 3% sodium chloride if all we need is a hypertonic solution rather than the salt content? Okay. Uh, there's a mix-up of, of terms, okay? There's a difference between tonicity and osmolarity. Okay, remember your basic concepts. D50 water is a hyperosmolar substance, right? And your 3% is a hypertonic substance. So if you give, if you have a hyponatremic patient giving a hyperosmolar, but D50 water is also hypotonic. It is hyperosmolar because of the high glucose content, okay? But it is hypotonic. Glucose cannot, cannot, it's a very, like urea, it's a poor, uh, so, uh, poor osmol. Okay, it will just go in and out and it cannot drive the water out of your uh, intravascular space. Okay, there's a mix of terms, okay? Hypertonic. 3% sodium chloride is hypertonic, while D50 water is hyperosmolar. Okay, but 3% is hyperosmolar and hypertonic. Clear? So there's a mix up of the concepts and that's why it's so difficult to remember to, tonicity and osmolar. Osmolar means more of water while tonicity is more of sodium. Okay? So you cannot give D50 water in a patient's hyponatremic. You'd be adding more insult to injury in that case. Okay? Did I answer that? Paolo, I hope uh, I... Uh, helped you in terms of differentiating one from the other. Next. Okay. Another question here ah, from Monet. Dr. Monet Cabral from all the way from Cebu. Please comment on the use of urinary sodium in replacing sodium loss for patient with cerebral salt okay. wasting. Now, let's go back. What is cerebral salt wasting? Is it a... a a high, is it a volume problem or a osmolar problem? That's the first thing that you have to answer. Cerebral salt wasting means you're losing sodium. The patient's hyponatremic because the patient is losing a lot of sodium, right? Is it, is it correct? And such that, what will be the clinical presentation of your patients with cerebral salt wasting? Their ECF volume will be low. Hypotension, sunken eyeballs, etc. So how can you now correct these patients. You look at the urinary sodium for patients with cerebral, can it be a false positive value? Okay. What is important is you want to restore the intravascular volume of your patient. Okay. So remember, cerebral salt wasting is more of a very, let's see, a wastebasket dis disorder that we we'll see a lot of sodium loss in a particular page. It's more of a volume problem rather than just a plain and simple or smaller problem. Okay. Okay. Um, Are we set up to that? Okay. Another question from Dr. De La Zena all the way back Ooh. from the Baos, the land of the president. Good PM, <laughs> Sir June. Inquiring about reset osmos. Osmostat. How do we recognize this phenomenon and how do we manage it, especially in our CKD patients? Okay. When we deal with CKD patients, like in this particular example, okay, you have to be very careful in looking at the, as you mentioned, the reset osmostat. Okay? These patients would try to reset uh, in terms of their osmolarity. Okay? So, Again, it goes back. What does this patient really require or need as a problem when this patient has CKD? Okay, is it again a volume problem or a smaller problem? Okay, so do you focus more on the osmolarity issue or more on the volume issue? Okay, so CKD is quite tricky in terms of managing. In this case, if in our particular case, it's so difficult to manage, especially they have this mechanism of reset osmostat. What is... Okay, another um, question. Ah, okay. What is your take on the use of sodium chloride tablet plus 
fluid restriction in patients with SIADH. Okay. When you have SIADH, means you have uh, too much, you're secreting inappropriately antidiuretic hormone. In other words, you are retaining too much water. Why, why are you giving that sodium chloride tablet with fluid restriction? It's similar to your 3% sodium chloride. It's trying to remove that excess water. But again, oral replacement is so difficult when you really look at SIDH. Number two, when we do fluid restriction, it's so hard to do fluid restriction in any patient, okay? Because with your fluid restriction, what will happen? Your thirst mechanism would be there uh, trying to make you drink a lot. So what will happen? It will just be a round robin uh, condition, okay? Uh, and that will be, sometimes uh, it's so hard to do fluid restriction in patients with SIDH, okay? Okay. Um, ah, okay. okay. Um, sorry, it's raining hard here, and <laughs> I hope if my signal uh, becomes erratic, I ask Carlo to okay take to over. There are centers who do not have three percent sodium chloride. Is it okay to give sodium bicarb half the volume, the volume of the required three percent sodium chloride? in acute severe hyponatremia. You're dealing with two components, okay? You have sodium and you also have bicarbonate. Okay, so how much is your sodium, how much is your sodium, how much are you giving? Remember, we have 3% sodium chloride. It should have around 516 mex per liter of sodium, okay? So it has 516. Why 516? If you're dealing with SIDH, acute severe hyponatremia, Okay, that's uh, my question. Let's do about, uh, let's just do severe hyponatremia. Uh, I'll talk about acute later on. So when you talk about uh, 3% sodium chloride, you need, why, is, why 3% is being given? Because of the very high uh, osmolarity of that solution, okay? Remember when you are SIDH in particular, you are already have a very high urine osmolarity. And the only way to draw that water out is you must in exceed that urine osmolarity and the only fluid available is 3% sodium chloride. Now my question is, how, how much is your, that sodium bicarb that you're giving? Uh, 100 mex, so it's, it's so hard to uh, answer your question without how much are you giving. What is important when you try to correct severe hyponatremia, your sodium component should be around 512 millimoles per liter. For it, to correct the hyponatremia. Now, let's go to acute. When you have acute severe hyponatremia, meaning it's just less than, less than 24 hours, okay? It means, if you remember, the idiogenic osmos are not yet there in the brain, okay? You can actually give, bombard them with a lot of uh, fluids and NSS to correct it. But when it's more than 24 hours, they define Chronic hyponatremia is more than 24 hours. If it is more than 24 hours, that's the time when you try to be regulating in terms of giving that uh, fluid management that you have. Okay? So, the well, let's remember, the 3%, it should be 512 millimoles per liter of osmolarity for it to, uh, to create, to absorb that water out of your uh, intravascular space. Otherwise, if it's less than that, it will be useless. Like... That's the reason why if you give 0.9 normal saline, 0.9 normal saline is how much? Uh, 150 times 100 milliosmoles per liter, okay? Your urine is 600 because you have SIDH, right? So if you have 600 milliosmoles per liter, but you're just giving 300, what will happen? To balance it out, it would retain that water. It would further worsen your hyponatremia. That's why we do not give 0.9 normal saline to patients who are hypo natremic, okay? We give 0.9 normal saline to prevent hyponatremia, but as a treatment, we do not give 0.9 normal saline solution. If you're dealing with clinical uvolemia, but if you're dealing with hypovolemic hyponatremia, that's a different story. Can you please okay. call back that? Okay. Can you please comment on giving tolbaptan for hyponatremia? Okay, tolbaptans, it's our, sometimes a last resort in giving it, okay? Especially 
if all the things that we're doing, uh, uh, it's not working. Okay, so we give Toldap time to help us in terms of uh, counter counteracting your vasopressin uh, hormone. Okay, we give that for refractory cases, but for just plain and simple hyponatremia, we reserve that. We don't do that usually. Do you think it's still necessary? Do you think it is still necessary to compute for a sodium deficit? Yes, if you are dealing with hypovolemic hyponatremia. Remember, when you're dealing with hypovolemic hyponatremia, you are losing sodium also, and you're losing water, but you're, more, you're losing more sodium than water. So you have to compute for that. The nit for the pediatricians out there, we still do that because you think the patient has lost sodium, that's why you really have to compute to replenish that sodium. But it is for your hypovolemic hyponatremia. Do I also use it for uh, clinical euvolemia? For, the, for giving 3% sodium chloride, I usually use that okay, in, in certain cases. Is okay. A, um, another in a question from Dr. Bonsamora. Patient in shock, would you still be a good victim to remember, call your correct volume first? Ah, okay. Okay. So, in a hypernatremic patient in shock, would it still be a good okay, thing so to remember? Thank you, Bong, for that question. Before dealing okay. with osmolality. Am I still being... Okay, I've heard, no? Can I don't hear, hear Dr. Bonson. Eh? So, I... Oh. Okay. Yes, no. I can see you. Okay. Yeah. So, this is the most important manage... Uh, Let's see, mantra of fluid and electrolytes. Okay, you have a hyper. What will you correct first, the hypernatremia or the shock? Okay, that's the sometimes the 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 question that we are faced with. Okay, yeah. the serum sodium is so high, but the patient is also in shock. So, what, will I correct the sodium first, or will I look at the shock? Uh, the, uh, look at uh, assess the shock. Okay, and what is important, I think, always to remember. Volume supersedes osmolarity. Look at the volume first. Never mind the hypokalemia, hyponatremia, acidosis, etc. Correct the volume first because sometimes correcting the volume, all these electrolyte arrangements go into its proper place because we all know that your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, when you correct that, it will correct all these electrolyte problems. Okay, so first correct the volume. Then once the patient is stable, then you focus on the hypernatremia, hypokalemia, acidemia, etc., etc. Um, I think Carlo has a question for you. What is your take on using urea for hyponatremia? Oh, line sound. I can't hear. Let's see. Sorry, uh, sir. Yeah. Hello. On the Hello, sir. chat on the chat box. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Bonson has having internet problems. So my question, my question actually is, what is your take on using urea for hyponatremia? Hello, sir. Nawala si... <laughs> Nawala sound eh. Hello, sir. Hi. Hi. Hello. Yeah, I think... Is June at home? We think he has uh, no, no sound. He can't hear uh, There's us. no sound. But I can hear him. <laughs> he, he cannot hear. Yes, no. May, may problem ba si June? Meron po ata. Hindi niya marinig. Hi, sir. 
Hi. Can you hear us? <laughs> no, he can't. No, he can't hear us. Sorry. <laughs> Siguro we can type. Kasi he can, he can answer it. What do we do, Carlo? <laughs> Uh, we've asked Doc June to just oh, look. Yeah, yeah there. Hello. There. <laughs> June, can you hear me? Answers. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. Yeah. I will have some sound. Okay. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Sorry. Yeah, you can hear us now. Oh, you can hear? Yeah. Uh, there's another question here. In a hypovolemic with, hy severe. with severe hyponatremia, up-to-date yes. recommends hypertonic sal saline plus desmopressin to prevent overcorrecting sodium since correction of hypovolemia can lead to auto-correction of sodium, sodium instead of NSS. Can you comment on that recommendation? Did you hear, June? Oh, no. <laughs> I think Dr. June is having some Technical signal problems. Yeah, what? <laughs> Should we end here already? Yeah, I, I think I know, ma'am. We can, if there are questions, additional questions, they can message direct Doc Jun directly. Message, yes. Yeah. So I think uh, Doctor Jun Anakleto might be having. Uh, signal problem in his place. So anyway, it is 7.25. And uh, if you have any questions that we failed to answer, you can message him directly and for him to um, uh, discuss your concerns. So Mami, before, share ko lang po itong ano, yes, ito yung yes. <laughs> this is what I mentioned earlier, the webinar next week, be sure to attend this, Optimizing Outcomes in PD Services in Resource Limited Settings, okay, a powerhouse cast. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank once again our lecturer, Dr. Juna Nakleto, for tackling a very difficult topic. Fluid and electrolytes is always a waterloo for everyone. And uh, also, uh, our partner for this uh, webinar, Sanofi and uh, Dr. Opi De Leon. Thank you and uh, God bless everyone. Be safe always. Thank you, Paul, ma'am. Thank you, um, Rael, Russell, and Carlo. It's actually raining very hard. I don't know if it's all over. <laughs> <laughs>